It ought to be pos possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated, as one would wish uh, his children to be treated. But this is not the case. Honestly, when you told me you wanted to do something using the grand foyer in both millennium stages, I thought you had lost your mind. The idea that we would use the grand foyer in a way that had never been used before. I was immediately transported by it. So Our way of actually connecting to the history was to put ourselves in the human aspect of it. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Creating insecurity, or Jack and Nikki do the Cold War tango for the Kennedy Center's 100th anniversary celebration of the president's birth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We'll talk with the choreographers, the composer, and a special chat with Deborah Rutter, president of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, all next on On Cue. Tonight's program is about a work of art, not about history. But in this instance, the history and the art are inseparable. Let's see not Berlin in common. Let them come to Berlin. The idea that you have a story to tell, that you are using a dance form supported by another art form, and that you were using an anniversary to sort of raise that story up and then make it happen within a really magical space. This was not just creating a new work for an occasion because it told a story that was so important historically, but it was in a space and it was sort of reflecting on him at this anniversary birthday. But most importantly, it was about how you use the space to tell the story. The Kennedy Center Grand Foyer is 630 feet from end to end, one of the largest interior spaces anywhere in the world. It's bookended on the north and on the south sides by two stages, Millennium Stages. For our purposes, Millennium Stage North was the U.S. side, Millennium Stage South the Soviet side. The space in between, that vast expanse of red carpeted land, all of the no man's land that lay in between. Most of the action of the show took place in between those two stages because the encounter between the US and the Soviet Union was fluid and dynamic and constantly moving. You'll see two different screens simultaneously, three cameras each, separate camera crews representing the viewpoint of the Soviet side and the American side. that after seeing the cares of office on you that he wasn't sure he'd ever be interested in being the president. I wonder if you could tell us whether if you had it to do over again, you would uh, work for the presidency and whether you can recommend the job to others. Uh, well, the answer is, uh, the first is yes, and the second is no. I don't recommend it to others, <laughs> at least for a while. To get us started, we're gonna take you inside the Bay of Pigs sequence from the show. It's April 1961. Cuba, 90 miles to the south, is a source of pride to the Soviets and concern to the U.S. The U.S. military wants Castro out, 
and they persuade a reluctant Kennedy to approve an invasion plan involving Cuban exiles, arguing that this plan, with minimal U.S. involvement and risk of exposure, will succeed in driving Castro out. It fails almost instantly. The Soviets stand up emboldened. The U.S. and the U.S. presidency of John F. Kennedy are off to the worst possible start. On the horizon, the first summit meeting between Kennedy and Khrushchev just a few months later in June in Vienna. So often we look at um, a work of art and we sit in our seat and we look at a stage and then within the use of the space on the stage, something exciting, interesting, intriguing happens. But here, by using that big long expanse of the Grand Foyer at the Kennedy Center and, and weaving through the audience as well, and then the different platforms and who were joining on each of the platforms. It, it was really extraordinary. In trying to stay as true to the historical idea as possible, the show was designed with two separate choreographic casts. There was a Soviet cast, there was an American cast. The American choreographic director, Rob Priori. The Soviet choreographic director, Catherine Pilkington. Both worked collaboratively with their own sides, but neither side was allowed to see what the other side was doing. 
there would be class at the beginning of the day, but then the two sides would go into different studios and they weren't allowed to look at each other's work and they weren't allowed to collaborate. The only time that that exception was made was for the Vienna summit between Kennedy and Khrushchev. The score was the same, a single score, by Gavin Stewart. But when Kennedy and Khrushchev, Priori and Pilkington came together, they found that the separation bore a lot closer resemblance than they might ever have imagined to the separation between the Soviet and American sides. During the whole process, we had been separated. So, you know, I'm coming in with a very specific way that, you know, the, the Soviet side had been working. He's working very, um, very much at the head of the American side. And so we had all of this backing up. And I, I always saw it as a tango, right? You know, like they were, they were just tiptoeing that line of pushing each other too far. We had our own little dance on the other side, <laughs> if you will, of how it, the whole, the, the duet was created. Yeah. We just sort of assume that these figures, these huge larger than life figures had it all figured out, but right. then you find out that people are people. People are people and they will speak around each other, even though, you know, trying to find any kind of common language, it was a lot of circling. It was a lot of turning in one direction and, and kind of just missing each other. Or we, when finally making contact, a lot of kind of um, battling, um, if you will. Um, and then, you know, the handshake in the center that was the what the photographers got and what the public saw and what you know everybody else on the outside didn't see all of the intertwining necessarily also this was a storytelling project for everybody you know we weren't mimicking or 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 miming anything but we had to tell this story and that was i still look back at it as one of the most uh it was a milestone for me in, in, in terms of choreography and in career. Kennedy, fresh off the problems created by the Bay of Pigs fiasco, goes to Vienna, Austria in June of 1961 to meet Khrushchev for the first and only summit of the Kennedy presidency. We staged it exactly in the middle of the grand foyer, almost directly under the bust of President Kennedy, opposite the Opera House. It's the only time the two men met. It's the only time there was physical contact between any of the two casts until the very end of the show. Here's the Vienna Summit.
presidents have put their official papers in libraries in their home states where they are not readily available to scholars and historians who come here to work with the Library of Congress and other agencies here. Have you decided where to put yours and would you consider putting it in Washington? Yes, I'm going to put it in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> It is our artists who will tell the story of these times. And it will be so important for places like the Kennedy Center to offer the platform for telling that story as quickly as we possibly can. Today's special segment of Sound Stages, which Gavin Stewart, our composer, also hosts, we asked him to go ahead and dive back into what we just looked at and listened to and break down for us how he made the score for the Vienna Summit. Here's Gavin and the initial segment of Sound Stages. Hey everyone, Gavin Stewart coming to you from the mountains of Western North Carolina with the Sound Stages segment today. I'm going to deconstruct some of the musical composition and production elements from the Summit and Vienna section. Let's start with the rhythm. The drums sound aggressive in the middle of the song there, and I use these rhythms that are uh, reminiscent of tango in order to uh, give it that sense of drive and pulse. I love the tango feel because it's all about what's not being played. In that way that a uh, competitive conversation really takes hold, it, there's, there's an edge to it. The hall at the Kennedy Center is so big um, and I wanted to fill every inch of that space with sound. And that's what I was trying to tap into for this piece. For, especially for the rhythmic sections. I use the orchestra to um, be part of that, those rhythms and I also use the drums. Everything sounds huge. Um, that was my goal. I really wanted it to be cinematic and big. The melody is the first thing that I wrote. I knew I needed a theme and again I wanted something cinematic and I wanted something that could occupy space. So I had done my research for about a month before this and I had a lot of information in my head and I had the title that Paul had uh, given me and so I used those things as my prompt for the melody. I really wanted to feel insecure. I wanted to feel what it's like when you feel like you're not enough for something. The melody is the response of me going to that place and I'm trying to unpack that emotion for myself. It's also the only uh, live player in this track that was recorded. Everything else is all um, drum samples and orchestra samples that I, you know, played them on my keyboard. But this was a, uh, an amazing, real, real violinist. <laughs> so the recording was done in a really small practice room at the Kennedy Center, and I needed it to be that way because I needed a, a dry sound, something that didn't have reverb on it in order to put it into the software and mix it in with the other sounds. But that means that when I put it in with the other sounds, it sounded kind of small. So here's what the violin sounds like by itself. And then here's what it sounds like when I uh, double it and then put it with some reverb. Soloing that with all the reverb and stuff, it kind of sounds like it's way too much. And, and, and usually I would be uh, uh, a little hesitant to do that much, but it really, really made the difference in the mix. Here's what the violin sounds like over the orchestra. So you can see it, it has this soaring sense, like it's, it's really in this huge space. And uh, I, you know, I wanted it to sound like it was there with us. So my goal was that wherever you were inside the Grand Hall, like it sounded like it was coming from somewhere in the Grand Hall but not next to you. So the, the composition was to tell the story as it was told in uh, Michael Beschloss's 
uh, the crisis years. I started with JFK in the embassy looking out the window. There's some beautiful quotes in the book, a chill wind shaking the pines outside of the embassy and Kennedy pacing up and down the hallways. He's nervous. It was also noted in the book that Kennedy took some painkillers before the meeting for his back pain, uh, which I relate to as a dancer, having some bad back pain myself. And so um, what I wanted to do is capture that sense all at once. So there's this little underlying beat at the beginning there that's made from these orchestral drum samples. And there's also this pad um, that, uh, that to me just sounded like, uh, like somebody might be numb a little bit. And then under that is this like really low drone that's like a very cinematic drone that's just like rumbling through the score. And it's meant to convey like pacing and stirring and something hanging over your head. And so the composition doesn't really have a, a final ending because there was no uh, resolution really that, that came from the meeting. I kind of just brought the tempo down and, 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 and tried to take it back to that low place that it started, um, but sort of more of like a reminiscent place than it, than it began. Again, I, I wanted to have a sense of, of cinema. I wanted to have a sense of uh, something big. And in my life, in my experience, the only time I've experienced that musically has been, you know, some rock bands, uh, some orchestra and symphony concerts, and going to the movies. And so all of that is really wrapped up into, especially into this piece. Yeah. Mr. President, you have said, and I think more than once, that heads of government should not go to the summit to negotiate agreements, but only to approve agreements negotiated at a lower level. Now it's being said and written that you're going to eat those words and uh, go to a summit without any uh, agreement at a lower level. Has your position changed, sir? Well, I'm going to have a dinner for all the people who've written it, and we'll see who eats uh, what. Uh. <laughs> In October 1962, the world came closer to nuclear holocaust than at any other time before or since. The Soviet Union placed inside Cuba, 90 miles off U.S. shores, tactical, short-range, and intermediate-range nuclear weapons. By the time the crisis was resolved, the U.S. was less than 24 hours from an invasion of Cuba. Taking the entire grand foyer and the two millennium stages, we chose to place the confrontation between the U.S. Cubans and Soviets less than 30 feet from the U.S. side, the north side of the Kennedy Center, to represent how close everything was to U.S. shores. Here's the Cuban Missile Crisis.
reaches the White House from Moscow. Chairman Khrushchev agrees to remove the Soviet missiles. The uh, following is the text of uh, President Kennedy's statement of uh, noon. I welcome Chairman Khrushchev's statesmanlike decision to stop building bases in Cuba, dismantling offensive weapons, returning them to the Soviet Union under UN verification. This is an important and constructive contribution to peace. Here in June of 2020, we are a long way away from the performing arts returning to anything resembling pre-COVID-19 normal. Deborah Rutter, president of the John F. Kennedy Center, who you've seen throughout this program, spent time with us talking not just about the JFK NSK concert, but also about the Kennedy Center itself, its plans, its thoughts, its hopes for the future reopening of the Kennedy Center as a national and international leader in the performing arts. Here's a bit more of our talk with Deborah. I uh, really believe in the mission of the Kennedy Center, which is this three-part um, sense of identity, which is really around being the national cultural center because we are the memorial to John F. Kennedy, being a world-class performing arts center, and then being the national advocate uh, and provider of arts education programming. And if you think about it as being mission driven as opposed to commercial or financially driven, then it's really about thinking about how quickly can we get back to delivering on that mission? How quickly can we invite individuals to come visit the memorial to have an artistic experience and to continue their lifelong journey in arts education? These moments in time and looking at 2017, there's a little bit of it, I hope, that is a bit of a roadmap for a possibility as um, we start to think about coming back. I don't think we understood it then, but certainly what you've been saying, how do you reimagine space in such a way that you can make art possible safely? And that's where you're going. Well, um, that's what I mean about these days are about how to be realistically optimistic. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I uh, am very um, fortunate to be um, not just the head of a very creative group of people, but the landlord of an amazing campus. And as I mentioned, with nearly 19 indoor spaces and all of that expansive outdoor space, we really believe that there are things that we can do safely um, and expansively and in, ex inclusive uh, of many as soon as we have that opportunity to open up in, in quite that way. And it, it will take a little bit of time um, because we can take something that maybe would most perfectly be in a small jewel box of a, of a theater and put it into a larger theater, which allows for the continuation of the program on the stage with an audience that will essentially support that kind of activity, we are more likely to be able to do that than those venues that don't have the multiple venues. Furthermore, I think using the reach as a place for uh, engaging art artists together safely in large enough spaces and then having audiences or patrons to be able to view that taking place or going outside um, and doing something that might be site specific could be really exciting. Um, you know, all of it's gonna be ultimately in the realm of what can we afford to do and can, how can we do it most safely. But, you know, we're not in the money making business. We're in the, you know, keeping our institution stable business. And that's the work that we're undergoing right now. But my energy is about how quickly can we be bringing people together to have these shared experiences that it is really um uh, it, it is who we are not just as americans but as human beings we want shared experiences you can find our full conversation with deborah on the company's website on our youtube channel and through our social media pages uh, we're in uh, 
contact uh, with uh, Dr. King and others who have communicated to us about it. I don't know any more outrageous action which I've seen occur in this country for a good many months or years than the uh, burning of a church, two churches, because of the effort made by uh, Negroes to be registered to vote. The United States Constitution provides for uh, freedom to vote. And uh, this country must uh, permit every man and woman to exercise their franchise. To shoot, as we saw in the case of Mississippi, uh, two young people who were involved in an effort to register people, to burn churches as a reprisal. With all of the provisions of the United States Constitution, uh, at least the basic provision of the Constitution guaranteeing freedom of worship, I consider both cowardly as well as outrageous. While big power politics were taking the headlines in most of the newspapers around the world, there were profound changes beginning to be heard in the United States and in the Soviet Union on a societal level. The pandemic of racism, of course, was the dominant overarching theme, but even underneath that, there were changes taking place in society. In the Soviet Union, de-Stalinization was beginning to take hold on other levels. New voices were being heard, voices which were unafraid to say what they thought and be who they were. We chose, as we made this section, to talk about Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his own words and James Baldwin in his own words. Пробило подъем, молотком обрыльс у штабного барака. Перерывистый звон слабо прошел сквозь стекла, намерзшие в два пальца, и скоро затих.
get on here. But watch the people move toward the doors. Watch the doors open. Watch them leave. It was mainly black people who left. He had thought that he would get off here and go home. But he watched the girl who reminded him of his sister as she moved sullenly past white people and stood for a moment on the platform before walking toward the steps. Suddenly he knew that he was never going home. The hardest thing about any program which deals with the Kennedy administration and with the president himself is the inevitability of its ending. 1963 seemed to be a year when the president had very much hit his stride. In June alone, he went to American University and gave what has come to be called his peace speech, a speech which reset U.S.-Soviet dialogue and opened the way to the first ever nuclear arms accord. Just a week later, he went on national television to speak to the pandemic of racism in the United States. In November, just weeks before his assassination, he gave what many consider to be the defining speech in the United States on the power and meaning of art. For us, as we concluded our concert program, we wanted to convey that sense of hands across the water and of the tragedy of losing John Fitzgerald Kennedy, as seen from both the White House and the Kremlin. Here's the conclusion of Insecurity, where Jack and Nikki do the Cold War Tango. Yesterday, a shaft of light cut into the darks. Negotiations were concluded in Moscow on a treaty to ban all nuclear tests in the atmosphere, in outer space, and underwater. For the first time, an agreement has been reached on bringing the forces of nuclear destruction under international control. Nuclear test ban negotiations have long been a symbol of East-West disagreement. If this treaty can also be a symbol, if it can symbolize the end of one era and the beginning of another, if both sides can, by this treaty, gain confidence and experience in peaceful collaboration, then this short and simple treaty may well become an historic mark in man's age-old pursuit of peace.
from Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago.
What kind of a peace do I mean and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. As we prepare to say goodnight to you, we want again to say thank you to the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and to the Center's President, Deborah Rutter, and to our colleague Meg Booth and Jane Rabinovitz for the incredible support that they made possible in the creation of this particular concert and so many other things we've been honored to do with the Kennedy Center. It's hard not to wonder what the world might have looked like today had we not had President Kennedy, his brother Bobby, and Dr. Martin Luther King taken from us in violence in the 1960s. These were people of extraordinary vision and leadership and the world very much needed them and in so many ways needs them now. It's a pleasure to be with you. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>